Hello everybody and thank you for joining us in the next video in our Beyond Coronavirus series. Uh, the topic for uh, this one is going to be looking at the emerging market consumer with a specific discussion point uh, looking at whether the emerging market consumer engine uh, that's been powering the world for the last few years, uh, if not running into a decade now, and whether it's finally run out of petrol. Um, just to kick things off uh, today, I'm joined by uh, Max Sat and Evelina from the investment team. Uh, just to do a little bit of scene setting before we get into some of the discussion. <clears throat> Within Dolphin, we're running um, the equity component with a sort of this concept of thematic investing um, on the satellite uh, individual stocks that we're holding. Um, one of the big drivers of the individual stocks is based on this idea of uh, growing levels of disposable income for emerging market consumers. What we've been looking at in the last couple of videos as part of this series um, is exploring how video game uh, usage and playing time has increased. And then last week we had a little look at the world of um, e-commerce. One of the key sort of takeaways that came out from that is that you know, the size of the e-commerce industry in China as one country is huge, both in terms of a percentage of retail sales um, and actual growth of the industry from a um, percentage year-on-year -year growth perspective. So what we have seen is um, a growth in disposable income for these emerging market consumers. We've been spending a lot of time uh, on the investment team here at Dolphin looking at you know, what are they spending this increased disposable income on, um, where are they spending it, and how are they spending it. All of these different components have started filtering down into our portfolios, um, into some of the securities that we currently own. Um, we developed back in March our uh, coronavirus resilience and recovery basket and the resilient names that we currently uh, have both are uh, situated in the emerging markets but also spread out across the world and different types of these companies are starting to feed into this thesis uh, on it in an increasing way over the coming years and we've seen that on a fairly consistent basis over the last five to ten years so what we're kind of trying to look at today is you know, what's going on uh, currently in China uh, and starting to look at some of the different uh, key contributors to growth uh, and what we could potentially hope to see over the coming years as well. You know, I'm just going to get this screen share back up and running and then I'm going to pass across to uh, Max to share a few of his thoughts. Um, thank you, Simon. Uh... So emerging market consumer uh, is one of our thematic ideas. Uh, we initially looked into that back in summer 2019. We uh, thought that it's an attractive long-term opportunity thanks to the uh, increasing purchasing power of consumers in emerging markets. Uh, and uh, well, since then, uh, we've obviously had a coronavirus outbreak which uh, began in China. So uh, for this presentation, we are focusing specifically on China as the country where it first appeared, but also as uh, the country that uh, first overcome the pandemic and uh, which may provide uh, some insight of how things may happen uh, in the future uh, in other parts of, of the world. Uh, so firstly, if we look at, a, at the Morgan Stanley survey, uh, which uh, asked consumers on about their out-of-home activities. Uh, what we can say is that uh, the situation is uh, slowly getting back to normal, but consumers are still being uh, quite cautious. Um, so one of the least affected areas is uh, grocery shopping, probably unsurprising. Uh, so 90% uh, of the respondents uh, reply that they are going uh, out of home uh, to the grocery shopping. Uh, more than half of them do it uh, more often than once a week and about a third uh, do it on a once per week basis. Uh, if we expand it uh, to a broader shopping categories and look specifically at shopping malls and street side, side stores, so uh, less consumers are going outside to do that and uh, the majority of those uh, who do do it on once per week basis. Uh, but if we look 
more at restaurants and leisure activities. Uh, this is where um, only uh, a minority of consumers do it outside of their houses. Uh, so for example, with restaurants, 32% uh, said that they do it once a week and 29% uh, uh, go outside for leisure activities. Um, and if we look on the chart on the right hand side, uh, and which focuses on future travel intentions of consumers. Uh, so this is where they are being uh, very cautious. Uh, so traveling within China uh, looks more or less okay. People have uh, yet some plans uh, to travel within China, but if you look at uh, outside destinations, even near, uh, near destinations such as Hong Kong and Macau, uh, so uh, majority of people either have no plans to travel there or uh, only plan to travel within the next 12 months or later. And then if we uh, branch out into international travel, uh, so 80% of consumers do not have any near term plans uh, to travel. And we actually have one of our team members, uh, Evelina, who is currently in China. And uh, Evelina, could you please provide uh, some comments from your personal experience? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Max, and hello, everyone. Um, I currently in Beijing, and I back to China on the second of April. And I have to say that this will be one of the most unforgettable experience of my life. And as someone might know, that due to the uh, restrict uh, uh, restrictions on the international flights, that there are very limited uh, tickets per week, and the demand is quite high. I bought seven tickets, uh, which all of them has been cancelled. But luckily, uh, my parents bought me uh, a direct flight ticket that from London to Guangzhou. And I prepared very careful before the flight. And during the, during the whole flight, I eat nothing and drink nothing. And when we arrived at the airport, and everyone took the nucleic acid, uh, nucleic acid test, and at that time, I got the, the symptoms, like I have the sore throat. So I write it down on the declaration form that the staff um, gave us. And I took another um, blood test. And after this, that we been quarantined in an appointed hotel there for two weeks. And actually, the, the quarantine time is um, better than I thought. Um, the, the room is nice, the, the stuff is nice, and we can have like um, online uh, deliveries and food deliveries. And on the last day when I received my uh, test results, I back, to, I back to Beijing. And currently I stay in Beijing for about one month. And I think that people's life here is um, on the way of getting back to normal, but um, still with a gap. Uh, most restaurants here are start to open and most parks or landmarks are reopened. I went to a uh, summer palace last weekend with my family, uh, which is very nice as, as usual. And the, the weather is nice and there's less people. So it's a good chance for taking pictures. Uh, the reason for that is that people can only purchase uh, tickets online for, for reservations. So they still need to control the, the number on each day. However, uh, in here, the cinemas and karaoke are remain closed and there's still uh, strict uh, restrictions on the international flight. So um, on my personal view, I think that China is, um, starts with its uh, recovery, but um, it still needs time to, to, to reach to the full normalization. And also they, they should be careful because there's a possibility that there might be a second wave of infection that happened in China. So that's all what I feel about my, my time in, in China. Thanks. I think Evelina has been, uh, you know, we're obviously speaking on a much more regular basis in the internal investment management meetings. Um, I think when you're saying how restaurants have been reopened, there's a lot of people uh, who are going to be sitting here in the West who will be jealous at the uh, even the opportunity to go to restaurants and landmarks because pretty much everything's been closed over here. Um, just, to, just to pick up on a couple of the points that you mentioned um, before we sort of carry on with some of the other slides. Um, when we developed this idea of the coronavirus baskets, one of the 
um, discussions that we were having in the Dolphin Discussions video on um, equity valuations was uh, A, the concern on the second wave that you mentioned, um, but secondly, in terms of uh, this unlocking uh, of different companies, different sectors is going to be happening at different speeds. And we've been having to, uh, and I know both of you have been working a lot on the names that can sit in the coronavirus recovery basket. And you, you kind of mentioned uh, two different aspects there in terms of uh, if we look at cinemas versus uh, restaurants, and we've kind of been looking at it in the same way in the UK in terms of how long until cinemas and restaurants are back open here, because what we are seeing at the moment when we're looking at things from an index level is going to be more on the, the lines of whilst a restaurant group is closed, its revenue is zero. So you know, when we're kind of looking at things from the valuation perspective, this has to kind of filter through to uh, emerging market consumers as well, because, you know, we've not seen a massive uptick in unemployment like we have in the US. I mean, China kind of clamped down very quickly and now slowly seems to be re-emerging, but it's way ahead of the rest of the world. I think the rest of the emerging markets are in a slightly different category. I and mean, one of the big questions here is going to be um, if people are you know, going through similar things to yourself in terms of quarantining, sitting there, you know, what we're trying to look at is, well, what, what are these consumers going to be spending their money on and how do they think that their financial situation is going to be going forward? So if I pull up this slide, then uh, maybe we can have a little chat about that. Uh, yeah, thank you, Simon. Uh, I can agree with you on the comment that uh, it would be wonderful to go to a restaurant. Uh, but unfortunately, we uh, do not have this opportunity uh, near term. And uh, so on the uh, household income situation in China, uh, uh, what, what you can see in front of you is the uh, results from UBS evidence slab survey that they did just recently uh, in May. and. Uh, so interestingly, what we can observe, uh, so first, if we look at the change in income, uh, so uh, around 54% of the respondents said that uh, the coronavirus outbreak uh, has impacted their income levels negatively. About 45 said uh, it's more or less stable and uh, a very marginal, uh, a small percentage uh, mentioned that it actually resulted in their incomes to increase. Uh, but if we uh, move on to uh, expectations for the second, second half of this year, uh, so uh, people, 42% of them uh, expect uh, their incomes to increase. Uh, around 43% uh, mentioned that it, they expect it to remain stable and around 15% 50, 15 uh, expect it to uh, decline even further. Uh, now, this is just an indication. We do not know uh, in the exact level. So for example, if people uh, are expecting uh, that the increase will uh, get back them to pre-coronavirus levels or if uh, it will be below that. But still, it's a, I think it's a useful uh, information to, to have in front of us when uh, deciding to uh, invest. And uh, in terms of uh, like broader financial situation within the next 12 months, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's actually more or less stable. Uh, so approximately the same amount of people uh, expecting uh, their financial situation either uh, to get worse uh, or to uh, become better. And about a third of them said uh, that it would roughly stay about the same. And now considering this information, uh, if we look into where they have uh, actually spent their money on uh, since the beginning of this year, so uh, the staples category have uh, uh, by now already recovered to uh, their pre-coronavirus uh, levels, uh, but discretionary spending is, is still muted. So uh, people approximately, it's, uh, if you compare it to the percentage of last year level, it stays around uh, 65%. So the overall aggregate demand uh, stays at around 8%. And, uh, if we uh, break it down further by category, uh, this actually correlates with uh, Evelina's comments earlier uh, on uh, restaurants, cinemas. Uh, so first of all, food delivery uh, uh, it feels uh, 
quite strong. So it's, uh, it's actually even high compared to the same time last year. Uh, so uh, to be more specific, 7% higher. So 107% of, of the uh, previous level. Uh, if we look at travel industry, uh, it is recovering somewhat, but uh, we need to remember that uh, this is mostly uh, inbound travel within China uh, as, uh, as it also correlates with uh, data from Morgan Stanley. Uh, students are slowly returning to schools. So approximately one third of them are back to offline education. Uh, but box office is that it's uh, as the cinemas are closed. It's, it's just uh, very unfortunate for them. And, and I think the big question from our side is, is how long they are going to remain closed. Um, it's interesting because we're talking about the um, emerging market consumer and how its spending has been powering a lot of global GDP growth. I mean, Part of that has been in uh, China, but when we're talking about online travel booking, we, we were looking originally in a recovery basket at the uh, having trip.com and a few other uh, tourism and travel related companies. And part of that is for uh, you know, the Chinese tourists that come over to the West and to Europe and spend their tourism uh, money uh, in our countries and our economies. That's obviously uh, taken a huge step back as well. And in the UK, we've now got this discussion of a two week quarantine period coming in for um, arrivals for anyone outside of France by the look of it. So I think there's going to be ongoing uh, lingering issues. Uh, putting it back to, to China, um, just in terms of how the money is being spent, I mean, we uh, released a, a sort of an Amazon versus Alibaba and one of the things that I thought was incredibly interesting is this concept of uh, ecosystem. And we were looking at the difference between uh, transactional and experience-led purchases, uh, but this kind of idea of having a bio, uh, a bio ecosystem, which is much more uh, prevalent, I think much more common for a lot of the Chinese consumers. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so actually, uh, as you Simon just mentioned, uh, when you and other team members discussed uh, e-commerce on in a separate webinar, uh, the fact that China is the largest e-commerce market in the world and then far uh, outweighs any other countries in the world, including uh, United States. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, the retail sales uh, over the past few years, uh, online good sales have uh, outpaced uh, offline good sales and uh, in the environment of lockdowns uh, it stayed it, uh, it managed to stay in the positive territory whereas if we compare it to uh, offline good sales they they went negative but all, but uh, especially uh, offline catering sales just fell off a cliff and then so naturally what this uh, resulted in is uh, the share of online retail sales have increased. So uh, if four years back, uh, online sales accounted for approximately 13% of total retail sales, today they are at the level of 28%. Uh, so the outbreak um, acted as a, as a catalyst, uh, but, but the long-term picture is, is very positive for e-commerce uh, in China. There's uh, still further room to grow and uh, the way uh, actually we expressed this view in our portfolios is that we have uh, two companies that are directly exposed. Uh, so previously mentioned Alibaba, but also Dragi.com, which is the second largest e-commerce player in China. Uh, but uh, e-commerce is not uh, the only opportunity that we see. Uh, we are also looking at the luxury industry uh, and on this, I would like to pass on to Evelina. Okay, uh, thanks, Max. And next, I'm going to talk about uh, emerging markets that relates to the luxury industry, which I, th I think is a very interesting topic. As someone might have questions and curious about how the luxury industry have been affected by the coronavirus outbreak and what's their current target consumer group and 
as we know that most people now stay at home during the lockdowns and without chances for traveling. So does they still have the passion about pursuing uh, fashion trends and keep buying the, the luxury products? Um, for example, like fancy Chanel bags, Gucci loafers, or a Balenciaga t-shirt. So today we are going to have discussions about these questions. So in general, not surprisingly, that the luxury goods market uh, continues to grow in the past years and with positive performance across most of its segments. And by 2025, the luxury customer base will increase hugely up from now and uh, mainly due to the growing middle class, especially in emerging markets. Uh, for example, for, for China, China's middle class is expected to uh, rise to more than a third of its population by 2030. And for questions like who will drive the, the market in the future, uh, the answer is uh, younger generation, particularly in China. They will be the main driving force for the global luxury market. Uh, millennials, or we call them Generation Y, uh, they have been uh, a steady uh, buyer of the luxury, and they account about 35% of the luxury consumption in 2019. And by 2025, that could make up about a 45%. And even for a younger generation, we call them uh, Generation Z. Uh, they're going to um, account for about 40% by 2035. So they're poised to reshape the industry. So we can say that these two uh, generations will going to dominate the market in the future. And for uh, millennials in, in China, they definitely will be the, the driving force for the whole market and they will be the key target consumer group for the luxury industry. And as a, as a Chinese that I have to say that um, it is quite um, scary, I mean, on the, on the positive side, that how the, the younger generation in China is um, so willing to spend. And China's growth um, has always been driven by the, the younger customer group um, compared uh, with what you can see from the mature market. And this thanks to the increasing disposable income levels and also the optimism about their futures. And one key feature for the millennials in, in China is that uh, most of them have uh, a strong and important uh, financial backings from their families. The over 50% of their social found that for the, for the luxury consumption is from their parents' found. And as the, the group of the millennials in, in China is getting bigger and bigger, and uh, more of them, most of them are become a more entrepreneurial and they're heading aboard for higher education. So combined together with these key features that they will definitely dominate the future market. And the Chinese market is expected to account for nearly 50% of the whole market by 2025. And secondly, um, on the side of the, the growing wave of the digitalization that continues to disrupt um, physical distribution networks, the online China um, is keep booming, especially in emerging markets and especially in China. And globally, that there are 75% of the, the luxury transactions were influenced by the online channels. And about 20 to 25% of the, the luxury purchases were digitally enabled. So we can see that there's a, a plenty of um, potential here. And now apart from this um, positive or bright performance, and now we move to the, to the current um, epidemic situation that we faced with a global collapse that driven by the, the lockdowns and shutdown of the tourism in all the key markets. So luxury industry um, faces a challenge like never before. But however, there's an, an emerging uh, bright spot. The Chinese uh, market on, uh, appears on the way of recovery. And the China began to lead away uh, towards recovery on the luxury industry. And currently, uh, the consumer consumption is largely normalized um, to the level about 90%. And is expected to have a, a recovery on the third quarter of this year that was 4% of the sales growth. And there was a sharp recovery by the end of the year uh, with 22% uh, 
uh, for the sales growth compared with only 1% uh, for other countries. And also the continuous uh, restrictions on the travel will mean that many purchases that would have been made abroad will happen in China. So reshoring definitely will drive a significant increase in the mainland sales in China. So in general, I have to say that despite the, the short term of the, the negative impact from the coronavirus outbreak, the luxuries um, long-term uh, growth path uh, will never change, will remain strong, which means that this epidemic will not um, alter its long-term growth. And currently for, for Dolphin, that we have an LVMH on our recovery basket. And there is an um, upcoming reports that are going to be released um, about the LVMH VS caring. So you can have uh, more information about uh, luxury industry from that. Thanks. Thanks, Evelyn. I think just, just from my side, one of the things that we've seen in terms of, I'm putting some numbers on it. You know, we were talking about the online uh, slight decline that we've seen, but remaining positive on a year on year basis. You know, when you realize that this Chinese market is three times the size of the US market from an e-commerce perspective, one of the big uh, important transitions we're seeing is going to be how well the luxury sector is able to adopt to the uh, slightly different demands of the younger generations. You know, we're looking at the um, passing down of wealth um, and how that's starting to impact what clients are looking for from a total portfolio perspective in terms of interest in uh, ESG or impact investing growing. And then you kind of have the same thing from a product perspective. You know, whether we're looking in food uh, and people wanting to have better understanding of the origin of their food and where that's coming from. And then also the similar sort of thing starting to go across to the luxury sector in terms of wanting to understand, well, where are the materials being sourced that you are uh, utilizing? Uh, whether you're kind of looking at um, a diamond in a Tiffany ring through to the kind of leather and the sourcing of the leather that's being used in a, uh, Hermes handbags. I think that whole sector is going through quite a lot of interesting uh, developments. The one thing that I'm uh, not quite sure about is uh, whether you can replicate the experience through this kind of online transaction, because I think a part of it is the experience that you go through in the shop. Um, from your perspective, Evelina, are most of those shops in China open or are they still closed? So what, what have you seen when you've kind of been walking around? Yeah, actually, I would like to say, mention one thing, actually. Um, before the, the holiday on May in China, my my mom received a, a message, text message from the, the sales from a huge shopping mall. And she told my mom that uh, the bag for Louis Vuitton or Chanel are going to increase their press levels, I think after the, the 5th of May. So um, me and my mom decides to, to, to go to the shopping centers and we see that there's a long queues, you know, in front of the Chanel store. So I was um, actually quite surprised that like, why do they have time and have money to spend? I know that, you know, uh, there's a, a, a male customer that speak uh, next to me and he just buy uh, four Chanel specs in one time. So, so sometimes I think that the situation in China is really complex that Mm, the, the, the consuming uh, consumption behaviors for, for the customer here is that I think they now kind of really pursue for the, how to say, for the, for the product with the brands to, mm -hmm. to, to get the feel self-satisfaction from them. So I don't know for other um, product categories, but I think for luxury, um, the demand is, on the, on the side of demand, is quite strong in China. I think um, I think Max and myself are probably both in the same category of never having bought a Chanel bag. Um, yeah. Max, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll definitely take your word for that one, uh, Evelina. Um, just in terms of uh, sort of wrapping up the conversation a little bit, um, you know, we've kind of segregated 
uh, China from the rest of emerging markets. Looking at the e-commerce, uh, you can kind of essentially add up the entirety of the rest of emerging markets from an e-commerce perspective, and it's still less than uh, China. Um, so it is the e-commerce market, and you know, as I said, three times the size of the US. Obviously, there's a non-e-commerce aspect, and China has been particularly strong in the luxury side. Um, uh, I know that, Max, you were looking at the education side. Obviously, we've seen that slow down a little bit, but the desire, um, as you mentioned, Evelina, in terms of parents wanting to send their children abroad for education is going to continue to remain strong. Um, I think what we're looking at from our side, uh, and back in February when we were um, having the sort of the virus starting to spread further around the world, our concern was on the supply side uh, because China manufactures a huge amount of um, different products for different companies around the world. And the, the, the concern was if China's in lockdown and uh, the country isn't manufacturing everything, well, if it's not manufactured, it's not possible to sell it. Now we're kind of in a position where a lot of that normality of way of life in China seems to have slowly resumed bar um, cinemas and karaoke's, which I've still never gone to and hopefully will never. Um, I don't want to uh, make people suffer listening to me trying to sing. Um, so we kind of seen that side of the world come back to some sort of normality, but it's in the West where on non, from a non-e-commerce perspective, we're still doing a lot of the buying. But if you kind of look around, uh, you know, we, we can tell you that you know, restaurants aren't open, bars aren't open, shops uh, other than essential shops aren't open. So this whole idea of um, the uh, spending side in the West, I mean, that's kind of dropped. Uh, we've not got the data and the graphs and one of the things that was interesting to see was you know, China's e-commerce spend spiked higher. Max Spencer mentioned the fact that it's been a catalyst um, because we've all had to transition a huge amount of our spending online. Um, I think the, the focus going forward from an e-commerce and an emerging market consumer perspective um, is going to be how quickly China is able to re-engage at sort of full capacity and continue forward. Um, because some of the data out of China has been quite negative. Um, but that being said, uh, I think that China is going to suffer a lot less than a lot of the developed markets, given that we're still on lockdown. And when we do start getting this unlocking happening, you know, we heard from uh, our prime minister in the UK that potentially if lots of different criteria are met, uh, restaurants and bars could be allowed the option to reopen at the beginning of July, providing that there's sufficient social distancing that still can be done within the restaurant. So we're already looking a month and a half to two months ahead before they're allowed to start reopening cinemas. I don't think we're mentioned at that time. So just on that side, I think for me, um, we're going to be very reliant on ongoing spending through emerging market consumers um, and we do kind of need them to continue driving the world ahead. We've had the luxury industry uh, and we can kind of include wine in that that's been uh, increasingly reliant on Chinese consumers uh, sort of from a demand uh, and sales perspective. Um, and we're, I think we're going to continue to see that uh, grow, evolve and develop over the coming years. Um, anything that the two of you want to throw in as a, as a last thought before I, I wrap up? Uh, well, from my side, I would like to say that uh, as we have initially uh, thought about EM consumer as a long-term uh, growing story, uh, it's, it's still still the same. Uh, the recent pandemic uh, didn't change uh, the long-term opportunity and picture, and uh, uh, we will continue to explore the changes there uh, further. Evelina, anything from your side? Um, uh, same as Max and I, I'm going to uh, keep focus on the, the luxury uh, industry and focus on uh, two single stocks comparison for the LVMH and carry. And we'll have more ideas and information for this. Thank you. Uh, just to finish up then, guys, um, thank you for uh, 
joining us uh, and watching and hopefully we've provided a couple of uh, interesting little data points, thoughts and insights in terms of what's been happening in China, the impact on the luxury market and the sort of comments around where we could be going. Um, next week, uh, we have uh, in the Dolphin Discussion Series uh, a really interesting conversation uh, which is going to be focused on you know, what, what do we do with this macro data. Macro data is backward looking. Some of it has been um, mind-blowingly uh, huge in terms of um, unemployment and, and some of the other bits and pieces that we've seen coming out. So that's going to be uh, recorded and released. Um, we're going to be doing uh, a broad update on our coronavirus basket. We've been uh, changing some of the names in the recovery side. We're deployed on the resilient side. So we're just going to talk through a little bit about what we've been buying, why, and what we've been changing on the recovery side. And then looking ahead even a little bit further, uh, we sort of linking back to the most recent conversation we had uh, about valuation. And we're looking at you know, is passive index investing finished for the time being, having had a really good run over the last decade. So we're kind of looking forward in terms of asking ourselves whether we are going to continue to see uh, fund flows going into that space and that product variety uh, because I think we're expecting hugely differentiated uh, performance numbers, revenue numbers and earning numbers from different companies depending on the sectors that they're in. Um, but, for, but for now, thank you for joining us. We hope you found it enjoyable um, and feel free to reach out and contact us if there are any follow-up questions. Thank you.